Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh University History and Games Lab podcast. In this series of episodes, we will be talking to historians, game, de- game creators, heritage professionals and others about history, games and the places where they meet. Uh, as for today's episode, I am very pleased to be talking with Roberta Taylor about her game, um, Creature Comforts. Roberta, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, how are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, so about Roberta, I need to introduce you. Uh, she is an analog game designer and consultant from Canada. And, Ke- and Creature Comforts is a, and I'm quoting from the publisher uh, here, the friendliest dice rolling resource collecting critter placement game for one to five players. Um, so basically the quickest way I can introduce the game, and I'm sure Roberta will, will have more thoughts on this, is that you have a family of forest animals and they spend spring, summer and, uh, and autumn preparing for, for winter. And then each round you send family members out to various locations in an attempt to gain supplies. And uh, if they fall short of their goal, they learn a lesson and be better prepared next time. Uh, so the family that has created the most comfortable then wins the game. Um, so this is, you know, a game all about being cozy, about preparing for winter. And as we've discussed before starting to record the podcast with, with Roberta, the winters in Canada can indeed get uh, really cold. Okay, so um, let's jump into the discussion. Roberta, how, how does a game like Creature Comforts come to be? How, how do you get started on it? Where did the idea come from? So Creature Comforts actually started as life as another game, um, but the, 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 core, the core of it was the same. And what, um, when I'm designing a game, I'm looking for is I'm always telling a story. And in this case, the story was the preparing for winter um, very much. And so when I decided to um, re-theme it, I, I, I tore it back down to its very bones and, and, and rebuilt it again. But the whole, all the mechanics and everything I put together there were with the idea of making this, this feeling of cozy, you're anticipating the long winter ahead and you're working hard through the summer to make those things happen and really telling that story of the seasons and um and so yeah for me it always comes from the story that you're that you're telling first so, so the story comes first and then one of the challenges of adapting a game to a story you know there's a lot of problems trying to to come up with a story that you know would serve the game well and then vice versa a game that serves the story well how how do you navigate that that balance um so i actually find it really helpful in the sense that when you're when you're thinking about designing a game there's so many places that you could go there's so many mechanics out there there's all these amazing ideas um but if i have a really clear sense of the story i'm telling and that that in in a game context is really the the space i'm building for the players to experience the story because you don't usually have like an actual plot line as it were in in a in a game but you're creating this space for players to create that story of their own and then i can look at each each idea each interesting thing that catches my eye and go well does this does this actually move me closer to to being able to tell that story or does it does it not and so it's um you know having that not the story and then who am i telling the story to who's participating in this conversation or whatever and um, what kind of emotion do I want to evoke? And those are just basically helpful markers to help make sure I'm on the right track with that game design. Mm. I see. Interesting. So um, my next question, and there's something I'm, I'm curious about. So obviously, tabletop is a lot about conflict. Uh, what made you want to design a game about coziness? You know, I don't think tabletop is cozy in and of itself, but I don't think a lot of the games have coziness as a victory condition. How? What, what is the reasoning behind that? Um, so I, I started playing games as an adult with my children, um, and they've now grown and left home and, and all that. But for me, and I think for a lot of, a lot of my friends, we're, we're not interested in, in the conflict, you know, life has enough of that. And when, when I want to have a game, I can sit down and drink a cup of tea and just hang out with someone over. Um, and there weren't a lot of those games in the market in that that is starting to slowly change. Um, but then when I was specifically working on Creature Comforts, I actually had done a lot of reading on the cozy video game genre and was like, wait, this this needs to come into my board game design. This needs to inform it. Um, and it really wasn't very different from my whole general approach to a lot of my games. But 
um, is I was able to be much more deliberate about some of those concepts of um, like you don't take things away from players and there's not really very much of any direct competition and um, you know this the events that happen in the game might be surprising but they shouldn't be negative and just thinking very carefully about how you um, evoke emotion in players um, was a big part of that so hmm. So it's all about not making the players feel negative, like that, like they're losing. Like the the purpose is always to gain something, to to not necessarily win, but to obtain. I suppose. Yeah, and I think that sense of of building your own little corner of something, like this, is why I think a lot of farming sims are popular. Um, but it's a similar idea, right? You're putting things together, and and you've got oh, I've got a quilt, and now I can have a book, and 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 those are all things too that evoke emotion in and of themselves. Um, and, and so even if you don't win the game, you can look at, but, but my family had, you know, bread and stew for the whole winter or whatever that thing was that you worked on in the game. And so even people who didn't win, you should come away from it feeling kind of happy about it. So that, that's, mm -hmm. um, and if you're looking at a game where you're playing with families, especially, um, children have struggles i mean so do many adults frankly with losing um and so when when you can make it so it's enjoyable regardless um because in a four-player game statistically you're gonna lose like most people lose so it shouldn't be a horrible feeling left in you <laughs> mm, yeah I, I definitely have moments when playing board games with my family where like it's it's frustrating to see to see someone lose and then you know have to you're still spending time with them and there's still this like oh my god i'm so I, I feel guilt when winning then i feel i feel like i'm I'm not doing well enough when i'm losing so a game like about coziness you know especially at these times seems perfect um did you have any particular so again again it's a it's a game about uh, a family of animals and, and animals and the animal world did you have any particular fairy tales or stories that you based the the characters uh from you know like i, I looked at the design you know i, I saw the the wolves but like, like to me, they're different than what I imagine, you know, wolves and, and, and stories and fairy tales to be like, how, how is the role that we've imbued animals with kind of changed in your board game, if it has changed? Um, I didn't have a lot of really specific um, inspiration, except that sort of general um, imagining of, well, if, if forest creatures were doing this, what would that look like? Um, and in my head... Um, I, I was thinking about this and like the um, there's stories when I was really little um, about Little Bear that were actually illustrated by Marie Sendak years and years ago and I think that that's sort of the little mama bear ba baking her cake or whatever she did in the stories kind of stuck with me but the actual aesthetic was all the artists they they told her you know we want this this feeling and this is the thing and um, and then just let her run with that um, and the art direction on that game was brilliant because they really they focus on things like how does the lighting feel and 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 that kind of thing. So you do have it all comes together in this really well thought out piece, which which was a whole lot of people other than me. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, going back to the idea of our winning conditions, I just realized. So it's a game that can be played from one to five players, right? Yeah. Um. What do you think the value is of playing your game or any game in in in, in general solo? What do you think the the value is of of experiencing a board game solo? Um, so I think there's a couple reasons people play solo games. One is um, it's often a good way to learn how the game flows if you're going to then teach it to someone later. Um, and the other is if if you're not able to play with people, it still can be like moving parts around a board and sitting there, there's sort of this nice ritual feel to it. And I think that um, I would imagine that during the pandemic, of course, that's become even more um, common for folks who don't, you know, live with people they can play board games with and, and that to really um, do a lot more of that. But um, for myself, I mean, board gaming is so, so social that um, I'll usually only play solo if I want to, if I want to learn it to teach, um, but sitting down and, and moving pieces around, like, I don't know, there's something about that, that every so often it's just the right thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I remember just, 
you know, just being even younger and, and playing games by myself and just, you know, playing with the, with the pieces and having a feel for, like, how the pieces move, like, how, how they look, like, you know. I remember playing chess when I was sick, uh, when, I was, when I was very, very young. And, you know, I, I have memories of definitely, like, tabletop coming to my aid. And even now during the pandemic, I, I still bought so many board games in this year of pandemic and having a good time with them. Um... So you mentioned that you, there's there's an entire genre about cozy games. Um, can you give us some examples, like for our listeners, like for other games uh, beyond yours that we might be interested in, like especially games in which we can win together? Because I think that coming together is is a pretty fun victory condition. Right. So in the in the um, board game world, um, I'm trying to think of examples that I would fall in there. There's a lot of new ones coming out, I think, that you're going to see falling into that. I've seen um, games about flowers and cats and whatever that I haven't had a chance to explore. Um, the video game sort of concept a lot is, goes back a lot further, and that's where this year's um, the Stardew Valley is a classic example. But yeah. the other one that just came out this last year... Um, Animal have, Crossing. Yeah, the Animal Crossing sort of a really well-known example of, of what that kind of that genre is um and um the uh there's there's games that i wouldn't say deliberately fall into the cozy game genre but that i find really um pleasant to play elizabeth hargrave's wingspan of course is one of those ones mm -hmm. where it's hard to be grumpy when you're just putting birds into your little habitat and watching that that flourish um and it's got a very different feel to it right it's it's um and then, and so there's um, games like that. The the hard part with examples right now is just that, yeah, I decide to go to work, barely leave the house, and I've got this <laughs> stack of things I want to explore, but those are usually reserved for conventions, which of course have been shut down. Um, but yeah, I think, and I one of the things I think is we're seeing a lot more female game designers, and, and mm -hmm. not that those games are exclusively coming from women, but I think that a lot of women are are designing in that space because that's the space we want to be playing in so yeah for, i have a few questions to follow this up because i think it is very interesting but my first one is how do you see uh tabletop in relate in relation to to video games again in this cozy cozy genre obviously the past few years in video games i had stardew valley and animal crossing just games that just like have i have personally spent like 200 hours last year just playing animal crossing how how do you think like uh, what is the relationship between like cozy board game, cozy tabletop, and cozy video games? Is it do they like supplement each other, um, or what do you think that is? I think that that both of them are are answering that sort of. You want to have a pastime that's positive and gentle, but the difference is that tabletop games are inherently social. And I mean, we did talk about solo play, but but for the most part, you're playing with people, and you're you're having this interaction that's kind of being mediated by the game. So it can it can be easier to play a game than to visit with people that you don't know well or that you have less in common with, but you can still have this common experience that's really positive. Um, whereas the video games tend to be fairly solitary. Um, and, and so they're really nice for that sort of quiet time away and, and sort of restoring yourself in that way. And I think they're very complimentary, but at the same time, very different um, experiences too. So, mm. And, you know, like you said that there's a, there's a lot more female game designers now. Um, what, what do you think like creature comforts will, will do in terms of like uh, being a source of inspiration? I'm, I'm thinking, you know, like, what do you think the impact will be? Do you think it will, um, you know, inspire more more future game designers, or female game designers in particular, to to get into this into this space. It's very much like ever since this the seventies and the eighties, just video games and just gaming at large has been kind of like a boys' club. How do you think like the impact of you know like female game designers will impact the entire industry? I think it's huge. I think that um, you know I'm. I'm, I'm thrilled to be having some success with this game and having um, another female game designer that people can kind of point to. Um, when Elizabeth Hargrave won the Spiel des Jahres last year, 
that was that was an unprecedented thing and there's a there's an enormous community of women working together and supporting each other and um developing their game design um skills and everything and and just seeing some some people getting somewhere with that and not feeling like you're you're just it's an uphill climb the whole time but also the more the more people who have that experience and success the more tools we have to support each other and you know there's lots of amazing guys out there designing games and just being so supportive and so helpful but it's something else when another woman comes alongside and says hey like i like let me introduce you to this person or hey here's some ideas or whatever um and it's also that whole representation thing right if you see other women doing it it feels less daunting so you know i'm really encouraged because um there's so much space for for creativity and i'm excited to see what people build yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for 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 the future of board game for a you know more inclusive just industry just at large. Um, so we spoke about working together with with other people, you know, with uh, with other other women as well. How I want to ask you, how was working with your publisher with uh, Kids Table Board Games? And I know we spoke in, before the recording about it, but I still want to hear your your thoughts at large about how that relation uh, relationship worked. For sure. So I. I cannot imagine having um, a better experience with a publisher. Um, Kids Table, um, Helena Capel is just absolutely phenomenal um, in in everything from being absolutely great at communicating, um, which so many publishers really, really struggle with. Um, I've had games where I haven't heard anything for months, like years even about, um, and to having um, just a real passion for making this game be the best it can be and be something that people want to play with their families people want to play with their friends or their kids or whatever and and this eye for detail um and i i just have to say like it it was such a refreshing experience to just be kind of it was neat to kind of sit on the sidelines and watch Mm -hmm. these people who really know what they're doing do it really well like it was just very cool yeah, on, on on the last episode we spoke with Joshua Gillingham, uh, the creator of Old Thingy, about how he was fully in control, and that's uncommon for game developers. Like he contributed to the art, he was very involved. Um, how do you feel about you know uh, this idea of like relationship with like your own game, about you know your own game changing in, in in front of you? How do you feel about like the changes that have happened from when you pitched your your design and and now to almost having it shipped out to to backers and people? Um. So. It's really neat in this case because they embraced the whole game. So my vision for the design, um, it was just, it, it was like it was a stone and they took it and polished it and cut it, and, but it was there. All Like I've had um, friends who've had games published where the designer had a very different vision and mm-hmm. so their core mechanics stayed, but they didn't have that same this, it didn't feel like the same game they designed the same way. Whereas in this case, this is exactly the game I wanted to make. And it's actually better than I could have imagined. They brought so much to it. Um, but it was very much the the, um, the vision that I had was part of what excited them about, about the game, um, which was really cool. So I don't yeah. think that that'll always be the case, depending on the type of design and stuff. And I've done designs for for clients that are to specific requirements. Mm-hmm. And there's a different type of like your emotional attachment to that project is going to be completely different. Um, and and if they take it off and, and do something different with it, it doesn't it doesn't bother me. It's like, well, this was my role in here was was this and I did that well and it's great and off it goes. Right. But it is kind of fun to have something that sort of start to finish matches my idea. Mm. Yeah, because I, I I assume it's difficult to have a vision and then to reach the final stages of the project and realize, hang on, this is not really how I had imagined it. This is, you know, so, something got lost in the process. And, and to hear you say, like, hey, like, this is absolutely my vision. It's it's very encouraging, I think, to, you know, game designers and future game designers uh, all over. Um, about the, the success of Creature Comforts, I... I'm floored by the success. I looked at the Kickstarter and I loved everything about the game. I loved the art. And I think a lot of other people do because you got almost 9,000 backers and uh, which they have pledged almost uh, £305,000 to to your game. I think it is incredible and congratulations to you and your your team. 
Um, so what's what's the plan with Creature Comforts? Uh, I know obviously COVID nineteen has probably impacted uh, your game, and you know obviously the tabletop industry has, has many others. When are we expecting to see Creature Comforts get to get to backers? Um, it should be coming out to people end of this year. Um, and that's, you know, they've left in room for some things to go sideways because they usually mm -hmm. do. Um, there's this whole weird thing right now with shipping and containers. Um, actually the last backer update, she sent a link to some articles about it because it's such an unprecedented problem with the pandemic and that. Mm -hmm. But assuming that that, um, doesn't go even more complicated than they expect, it should be to folks at the end of this year, which is very exciting. Um, it's it's going to be neat to have. I'm excited to see it, but I'm more excited to see like friends and family you know, get their hands on it. And, and um, you know, um, just even people I don't know when you start, if you see someone be like, you know, my kid played this and they love this about it. Like, that's just so cool. So and yeah, hopefully before Christmas, I would love that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Christmas, I think, will be a perfect time to to play with this with your family. Just bundle up, just just make it cozy. Absolutely. Uh, do you have any plans for a digital version? We spoke about Wingspan, um, and obviously this is you know far just far into the future. Any plans for a, perhaps a just a store edition? I'm not sure if I, I know this goes to backers, but will it go? Will it, will I be, for example, be able to eventually buy it? Will our listeners be able to? to buy the game eventually if they haven't uh, backed it on Kickstarter? Um, so digital, I don't know. Um, Kids Table has not done digital before that I'm aware. Um, of course, there's a clause for that in every single contract ever, just in case. But um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know of any plans of that for now. And for the physical game, it is being translated into nine languages other than English. So it should be available in retail, like practically everywhere. Um, it's going to be in Korean and Czech and Spanish and Italian, and I don't even know um, the full list. Um, and so it ha has gotten a lot of interest for localization and, and will, um, will definitely be in distribution and in retail too. So Wonderful, because honestly, and, and listeners, please believe me, I, I've looked at the game and I'm like, I want to have this. I'm so sorry I came late to the, to the Kickstarter party, but it is such a delightful game and I've been, I've been meaning to get my hands on it as well. And uh, maybe, again, with, with people from the History and Games Lab, I'm looking forward to playtesting it and just playing it and just uh, sharing our experiences about, you know, having this, this, cozy, this cozy activity with this cozy game. Um, so... You've been designing you've been designing uh, tabletop games and just games in general for for long before Creature Comforts. How did you first get into game design and and why? What is it that attracted you to to, to games? So I started playing games, like I said, when my kids were growing up, and um, I I I discovered the board game geek because I was trying to find games that would interest them. Because the truth is, I like games, and they would kind of play them to be nice to me. But it was a good way to spend time with them as teenagers, right? And when I was on there, I stumbled on um, a little kind of a here's a game design. It was like a contest, but it, it was there was no prize. It was just a, an activity um, by um, Sean Ross, who's a Canadian designer who designed a card game called Haggis. Um, which is a brilliant, brilliant card game. But I was like, hey, this is kind of interesting. And at the time, we lived in remote northern British Columbia, and I was spending half hour each way um, driving to work on empty highway. Mm -hmm. But my job was dismal. My job was horrific. And it was very, very stressful. And I realized that thinking about this game um, design was keeping me from spending the entire commute obsessing about all the things that had gone wrong that day at work. And um, so I kind of followed that through and discovered that I really liked this. I'm not bad at it. And I had the incredible fortune of getting invited to join the Game Artisans of Canada, which was at that time a brand new fledgling game design group, just of people who wanted to do this and wanted to learn together. And that group um, was absolutely amazing um when we started i think between the whole i know there was probably 12 or 18 of us there were three games printed and now i don't even know we can't nobody owns them all there's so many and there's so many amazing designers that grew out of that um shared 
like we had forums and everyone was like, well, I've tried this. What do you know? And like just every kind of information sharing from contracts to mechanics to you name it. Um, and that just was amazing because like I said, I, I was living remotely. I didn't even know other gamers, but I had access to this great group of creative people. Um, and so then I designed um, Octopus's Garden and that game, I, I, you know, there's a game design contest at the, it was the Falcon Gaming Society in Calgary, Alberta. They did this contest and I was like, oh, I'll put this in there. And that game actually won, which led to a publishing contract. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm actually a game designer now. Like it went from kind of a pastime to a thing that I, I realize oh, I can do this and I do it well and, and people want to see my games. And so that was kind of the start of, of exploring this all. Yeah, and, and congratulations for Octopus Garden. Yeah, I, I, I looked it up and I was like, yeah, this is award winning. This is phenomenal. Um, so what are you ultimately trying to achieve with your games beyond having fun? Is it to instruct? Is it to educate? Again, last week, uh, sorry, last month, we spoke with Joshua about like his desire to to inform, to educate, you know, beyond having fun. What would you say is is your desire with your games? What is the ultimate aim or, or goal? Um, I think overall, it's about connection. It's about creating places for people to have great memories together and build community and build those relationships. But I also have a really, really deep interest in the ability of games to introduce people to new ideas. Um, I love the fact that games can let you put yourself in someone else's shoes, as it were, and experience something that you wouldn't experience otherwise in one way or another. Um, and I, I think there's immense potential. Um, and and I, I've seen games like the whole, the whole sort of idea of gamification took this and it made it into like a carrot. And that's not what's interesting to me. What's interesting to me is this total ability um, and role-playing games do it very, very well. That's their whole thing, right? Um, but I think that tabletop board games have like um, the ability as well. And so um, I'm very also, very interested in exploring that, um, which is where I do most of my work for clients um, is is creating games that, that take their big idea, whatever that is, and introduce it in a way that's engaging to the players. Um, and you could say it's educational, but I think it's broader than that. Um, I mm -hmm. think it's, it's even in if people walk away from the table and um, are having a conversation they wouldn't have had about something or thinking about something that this hadn't actually occurred to them before um, about how they are in the world. Um, I think that there's there's so much um, potential there and that really fascinates me. Mm. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, like here at the at the History and Games Lab, we are speaking about the ways in which history meets uh, games and, and game designers and, you know, uh, uh, analyzing and exploring the social, the political context that we're in, um, you know, and, and I think that's the kind of conversation of like, hey, like, you know, in Creature Comforts, we collect, you know, materials to, to survive the winter, but like, and what do we do in these other games? You know, we conquer, we colonize, you know, I'm thinking of even like, like all of, you know, the, the entire genre of wargaming is just literally a conflict as we've, uh, we've discussed. Um... Yeah, going on to 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 then this this more historical approach for our listeners, more interested in the history aspect. Um, what is your take on on the role of history for analog games? Um, is it important for you that tabletop games are historically accurate? Um, I think that really depends on again the story they're telling. Um, and if you're if you're making a game that's dealing with something historical, I think that it's your responsibility to think about that. And um, if if you're creating an alternate history, that had better be clear. Um, you know, it's really it comes all down, I think, to the um, you know, so many of these games about the past take a lot of things for granted about colonization and about the way that Europe interacted with the rest of the world. And I think if game designers just sort of put their fingers in their ears and pretend that it doesn't matter, we end up just perpetuating a lot of really um, uh, untrue um, colonial history and things like that, where, you know, the victory, right, the victors write the history. And I think that 
some really smart people have started guiding some great conversations about how, wait a minute, um, you know, it's not okay that the, the, um, you know, little worker cubes in Puerto Rico are brown squares and, and no one's talking about mm-hmm. the fact that this was real human be- lives who were, who were enslaved at the time. And, and that, you know, ethically raises a whole lot of questions, but, you know, I think the thing that the responsibility with history is to, um, not, not look at it through this sort of, um, a lens of assumptions, right. But, um, to, to sort of dig in deeper to what actually happened and who were the, who are the real people who are really impacted by this? Um, I once had the very great pleasure of taking a workshop, um, run by, um, Oh, I hate mornings. Why can't I think of names? <laughs> and uh, Jessica Hammer and, um, her, her co-designer, um, designed a role-playing game about, um, the experience of, um, Jews in Germany in the Second World War. And she talked about looking across the grain of history um, and looking for the parts that history textbooks essentially leave out. So in this game, it was focusing on a specific, it was it was specific demographic and it was uh, around a specific event. But I think that, um, you know, this is when you look at these war games, um, especially that, that tend to do a lot of the histories often in the wargaming world, there's no civilians, there's no women, there's no children. And, and um, I, I think that that's an oversight that is problematic. Right. So yeah, that was a really long answer because I have thoughts. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I absolutely want to dive into it um, specific, specifically because you've you've made two games that have historical backgrounds that, you know, like are about, you know, the meaning of, of, of you know, incorporating history. And I'm speaking about Algeria 1857 and exploring Wako, Wakotowin. And I'm so sorry, like I, I will I'll be about your indigenous uh, indigenous names. But both of these games that you've, you've been developed, the first of which, which is uh, Algeria, a game which depicts the final military conflict in the French coast of the Kab- Kabila region of Algeria and from 54 to 57, and w- Wakotowin, which is a board game aimed at junior high age students that's currently in the prototype stage, which allows players to become indigenous families whose lives are affected by a treaty. Um, with both of these games, how how do you do your research when, when you sit down to create a, a, a game based on on real history you know on on factual history how do you where do you start what is the first step does the game come first or does the does the you know historical context come first so both of these games were designed actually for clients who who had a specific subject they wanted treated um and um so the um algeria game um the entire point of that game design was to explore this specific conflict um, through um, a more feminist lens because wargaming struggles with a lack of women and that conflict involved um, uh, women who were um, active in it in ways that were unusual Um, and so the the beginning of that was a huge amount of research Um, the client sent me all of his 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 research and thesis and everything but then also dug into the um, more um, first-hand accounts from the era, so pulled up PDFs of old French um, journal reports and whatever. Um, and it was very frustrating because we're telling the story of the Kabul people who were an oral culture who were conquered. So there's very, very little from their point of view, and you're trying to piece things, things together from the French very, very arrogant colonial attitude of the day um, and, and trying to dig under that. And that there really isn't a lot of resources. Um, thankfully to, um, the publisher for that game had started the process by finding, um, an Algerian Kabul culture consultant that we could go and say, like, are we making the right assumptions? Did we, did we get this right? Um, because, you know, you, you feel this huge responsibility telling someone else's story. Um, and, and trying to to do that justice, and I'm sure that there's things that we didn't get right. But you know, I I will say we worked really really hard to avoid that because it's an issue of respect. Um, 
And also, I think it makes a better game. Like, you know, really, for me, again, it, because I'm the story person, I really want to know, like, well, what was going on? And how did this affect these people's lives? And I want that to come through in the gameplay. Um, and so, um, you know, for that one, it was a lot of books, and it was a lot of pouring through um, these things. Um, for exploring Wakotawin, it was... Um, Again, that's talking about uh, local um, Treaty 6. Um, in Canada, the numbered treaties happened um, as, um, you know, the, the um, colonization of the country happened. And they're very impactful and they're very contentious even to this day because, um, firstly, it doesn't help the Canadian government has ignored them whenever it wants. But, um, again, it was with a culture that had an oral culture, not a written culture. And so we actually were very fortunate. Um, we were working very closely with the local Indigenous w Wisdom and Knowledge Center, and they had, um, we had an elder spend um, all our meetings come on there. And, and so if I had a question, I could listen to him tell me, well, you know, this is what I know from my grandfather, and this is how our culture works and, and whatever, um, to try to make sure that the things I thought were most important about this story were the things that he felt were important about the story too, because I only have my white settler perspective here. And what I bring to the table is my ability to make games, but you know, they, these people um, that we we're working with, they were the ones who actually had the understanding of what we're trying to communicate. Um, and we really wanted people to understand the experience of families living under these treaties and what that meant to their actual lives rather than, you know, learning history is a series of dates that things happened. Well, this was signed here. Well, but that doesn't, that does not, that's not what affected people. Like, you know, technically it did, but what affected people was there were no more Buffalo. And so now they couldn't feed their families in the winter. And so when they were offered this really, really mediocre deal, they felt it was that or their children would die. Well, now they're going to sign this thing that's a whole bigger picture, right? And so um, definitely for me, understanding as much as possible of, of, of what happened and that, again, the human actors in it um, is important. And, and do you think, like you mentioned, there might be some things that might have gone wrong in terms of like, you know, conveying the story. How about the game? Do you think, were there any concessions in between like, this is the story that you have to tell, but this is what the game needs to be? Where do you compromise? Do you compromise on making the game less fun, but making the story more accurate or vice versa? Or does that not really, is that not really a factor in how you design games? Um, it, it's interesting, actually, um, both of these games, um, don't always feel very good to play. Um, and that's by design. And it's actually really strange to design a game that isn't, it's engaging, but it's not fun in the same way. You come away from Creature Comforts feeling cozy and warm. You, you come away from playing uh, Exploring Wakoda Win very unsettled um, because you're telling a history that happened and you're, if you're not glossing over the, the struggles, then the players are going to have this emotional sense of, oh, you know, and, and that, it was hard designing that. I have to say that that I sit down to a play test and I would be very grumpy, but I'm like, well, the game's working really well, but I'm grumpy because I don't really like feeling the subject matter, right? But um, when when you're creating a game that's, this is specifically for use um, in schools or with new Canadians to teach people, and we want to build empathy. And if, if you don't come away from this experience feeling unsettled, we haven't succeeded, right? Um so that was a very different experience. And I, I think that the gameplay, like I said, I think it's engaging. But in that case, you're making this trade off of, of well, this would be more fun, but it wouldn't be true. Um, and if I was just making the game for fun and, and, and did that, I wouldn't be being at all respectful to that subject matter, right? And so I would need to just find a new theme and take that mechanic somewhere else and I think very often that's what happens. You just write it down and you're going to use it a different day in a different place, right? Where it actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And I'm I'm thinking, how is it rewarding to to, to uh, 
is it a one-time experience? Like you go through a DLG game and you're like, okay, it's a one and I'm done. And I'm like, whew, okay, I've, I've, I've gone through this. Or do you do you play it again? And like, how how do you expect... Um, obviously, with, with Creature Comforts, I think it's a game that you can play over and over and over again, even during the span of a day. But how do you think these two games are played? Can you play multiple sessions in a day and not be, you know, not feel guilty or, you know, feel like this is a, 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 a heavy and you know, a tough subject matter? So the Exploring with Codewins designed for an educational context. It's it's more designed to be used with a, a facilitator. So you could play it again, but it's not very likely that that's going to be the case. The the Algeria game um, is definitely, I hope, will be played again um, over... Um, in the end game, we didn't give players the ability to play the Conquerors, the French. You can only play mm-hmm. the Cabell um, people. And it is a cooperative game, kind of. Um, I would say semi-cooperative would be the appropriate. You can you can um, be the last person there and, and win, and everyone else has already been conquered or whatever. It's possible. Um, but the ability to try different strategies, to work together with your teammates against the the um in wash of, of conquering French um soldiers is I think got a lot of potential for exploration. Um it's it it was a very difficult thing in that game actually that gave us the biggest challenge was trying to create a win condition in a situation which was unwinnable. Um the the Cabil um people had about four thousand guns um, we're talking like long rifles, um, and the French pour tens of thousands of men and uh, artillery and whatever, and they had basically bottomless resources, um, and it was just a matter of time, and you're not going to change that. So what's a win condition in an unwinnable situation? We we decided that it would be a win if you made it through the summer of 1857 without being conquered. Um, and I mean, truthfully, had that happened, you would have had a really hard winter and would have happened to to get conquered the next spring like it wasn't like you actually have won anything but um and so trying to um do better i think than history with the tools that were given to the people at the time is an interesting exercise um and hopefully people will find that something they can revisit mm, because I'm, I'm i'm thinking of uh, i've definitely played tabletop and video games where the purpose is to change history in the sense that you know you've made it through this like otherwise you know catastrophic event you've made it otherwise this you know you, you've survived despite all the odds you've, you've made it to the end you've made it past the finish line and that in itself is a is a, is a victory and again I, I love this idea that you've introduced in creature comforts as well of winning together of because i don't think that's necessarily very uh very common in tabletop or any games where you win together it's usually i win against you someone wins against me uh, winning together, I think, is a is is something that feels refreshing and that feels feels fresh. And I think that we should have more about more of that in 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 games. Um, the final set of questions for you now. We're we're about you know about to about to close out the the hour. What comes next for you? What are the projects you can tell us about? Um, obviously, um, Creature Comfort is going to go to backers this December. What is next for you? Um, maybe is the is the life left in creature comforts, or are you just going to to a different project altogether? Um, so I have a few things coming up. Um, the Algeria eighteen fifty seven game, um, which may or may not keep that title. I don't actually know what the publisher is doing. Um, should be on Kickstarter before the end of this year. Um, which um, I'm very curious to see. The art that's been coming out for that game looks amazing. I'm very excited. Um, and then, so the game that was Octopus's Garden, um, is getting reprinted, um, and that's a company under Madago out of France, and they're planning to do a small Kickstarter again before the end of this year for that one, um, and all fresh art, and it was, um, a fun chance to revisit a design, um, with, you know, 10 years of experience in the middle, um, and look back on it and go, what, what do I love and what would I tweak, um, and then down the road further, you know, we're talking um, with Kids Table about um, another game set in Maple Valley where Creature Comforts was set. Um, and that's a that's a ways off, but that's a fun project to contemplate. Um, and a few other things, you know, here and there um, that are, you know, in various stages from idea to whatever um, that that'll be showing up in different places. Um, so... 
yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff on the, on the horizon. And, and it's neat for me that I have some games that are really very hobby market, very family focused, and some games that are much more in uh, what I would call the serious games genre, where, you know, we're looking at a specific idea or whatever. And um, so hopefully um, I'll keep getting opportunities to do that kind of stuff too. Wonderful. And, and hopefully uh, we will also have access to them. And again, as, as I mentioned, look forward to... Uh uh meeting people from the lab from the history and games lab and playing with them and you know introducing them to to your games because again the art of creature comforts and you know i've looked at octopus garden and everything looks amazing and i you know i just really want to to get my hands on them um Roberta, thank you so much for being with us thank you so much for for appearing on this podcast if you had one piece of advice for people wanting to get into game design we have a lot of people wanting to get into into game design what would your advice be what would you say that they do first um so well first you play lots and lots of games um but if you're looking to make a game my advice to new designers is always the same is make an ugly prototype really fast and don't be afraid to change it um because that's where people get the most hung up is they spend too much time trying to make it pretty when it's not solid yet and then they're afraid to throw away bad ideas make it fast, make it ugly, change it lots, get out the Sharpies, draw over top of stuff and play it and play it until it's actually closer to your vision and then worry about making it look nice. Okay, so just just make the game, just finish it, just just have it done. That's right. And then make another one. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you so much again, Roberta Taylor, for, for being with us. Where can our listeners uh, find you? Where can you know they find your material uh, get in contact with you where would they go to find um, you so you can find me on twitter at infinite roberta and um i have a website it's robertataylor.ca and also if you would like to get in touch for a potential podcast appearance our dms are open on twitter at uh, hng lab or you can email us at um the link in the description i will have the email in the show notes and the description and or me personally again my email will be there as long as roberta's contact and the website for more on the History and Games Lab, please access our Linktree link where you will find all of our output plus our social media. Again, everything that you need to find about us is going to be in the description. Thank you so much for listening and we will see you next time. The Edinburgh University History and Games Lab podcast is a production of the Edinburgh University History and Games Lab. For more on us and future podcasts, connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and or Facebook by searching for Edinburgh University History and Games Lab. We should be the first result. Music for today's episode is Call to Adventure by Kevin McLeod, used under filmmusic.io standard license. For more information on the link and the license, please check the show notes. Thank you for listening, and please join us next time.